Welcome to the How to Program with Java podcast, where all you need is the desire to learn and you too can become a Java programmer with absolutely no knowledge of programming. And now, your host, Trevor Page. Hey everybody and welcome back to the How to Program with Java podcast. We are already at episode number 25, which is, I feel like, a, a real um, marker in my uh, feat of becoming a podcaster. I think 25 episodes in officially makes me uh, at least a little bit more than a beginner at podcasting, so that's, that's pretty cool. So in today's episode, we are going to talk about uh, two topics, um, which I sort of covered back a couple of uh, podcast episodes ago, um, where I talked about uh, interview questions. And I hit a couple where I said, hmm, I actually didn't even talk about those uh, at all in the podcast. So I decided, hey, might as well follow up my word um, when I said that I would be talking about those. And I'll talk about those today. All right. So that's going to be covering the topics of the final keyword, as well as an object-oriented programming concept known as encapsulation. Okay. So before we get rolling, let's go to the reviews from this past week. It seems as though I didn't get any uh, actual five-star rating plus reviews, although I think uh, someone, uh, a listener by the name of Josh, uh, said he left a review, and he also left an email for me with a question in it, uh, which I will be uh, addressing at the end of this podcast, because he asked an excellent question. Uh, But there was another comment that came in from uh, a fellow um, programmer slash software engineer um, who who noted that I had made a a, a boo-boo on my last uh, recording where I was talking about the calendar object inside of Java. Uh, I made reference to the fact that the calendar has a get instance method, uh, which I incorrectly labeled as a a singleton um, and that you can use the get instance to uh, return the singleton uh, calendar object. So this was a mistake on my part because uh, when whoever it was that taught me about singletons and whatnot, um, you you use something called a get instance uh, method to return the instance of the uh, the object, which is usually a singleton. But apparently that is not universally true. As with all things in programming, there's always exceptions. Um, so it's totally my bad for not going out and, and, and doing that research and just taking someone's word for it and, and going forward and presenting you that information. Um, so I apologize for that. But the calendar is not a singleton. Um, and as this uh, reviewer had uh, mentioned, that would be a thread safety disaster. Um, so fair enough. My apologies. Um, so yeah, if you have any sort of uh, feedback on, on anything that I say, if I you know goof up on some sort of uh, topic and you know that I made that mistake, by all means, email me, let me know um, that I need to revise that so I can get the word back out to all the listeners. Um, you know, I'm human. I, I, I make mistakes. I apologize. Um, but uh, hey, everyone, uh, everyone drops the ball once in a while. So um, but yeah, I will ask that you just send me an email instead of doing, he kind of went through uh, the iTunes, you know, he went through all the trouble of leaving a negative review in iTunes, um, which actually does damage the uh, reputation of the podcast. So, you know, if you have um, a comment or, or something like that about, um, you know, something that I've said or whatnot, it's usually better to just send me an email instead of going through all the trouble to actually, you know, tarnish the uh, the actual work that I'm trying to do uh, for all of you guys out there. So, Having said that, let's move on to the actual topic at hand for today, which I said uh, was two things, the final keyword and encapsulation. Okay, so I think I'm going to start with encapsulation first and uh, and then move on to the actual final keyword. So uh, encapsulation is actually uh, essentially one of the four fundamental object-oriented programming concepts. Um, now, I've already discussed three of them before, and that was uh, polymorphism, abstraction, and inheritance. So those uh, I've already talked about those. I won't go into any further detail about those. If you want to learn more about them, just go back to you know close to the beginning of this podcast series, and I will cover those topics. Um, but the topic at hand today, which I didn't really get much into, was encapsulation. Uh, and that's really the the, the fourth uh, object oriented principle that um, that you would well, that you can learn about. So what is it all about? Well, it's actually something that you already know and you already actually do. 
So anytime that you've created an actual you know domain object or something with a um, with a bunch of private instance variables that also have public getters and setters to you know show the actual values where you can you know use the setter to change the value of that instance variable or the getter to retrieve the value for that instance variable. Um, that in itself is encapsulation. It's also known as sort of data hiding. And it's done by making the actual properties of the object, uh, which are the instance variables, uh, making them private. Okay? So as soon as you make those private, you actually hide that data from the outside world, from the outside classes and whatnot, um, in such a way that they cannot modify that data. And the only way that you can modify that data is by going through the publicly accessible setter method. So you actually have to call the set, you know, property name for that particular instance variable. So if you have a user object that has a user name instance variable, you know, defined as a string or something like that, you have a public set username method that you can call and you pass in the value of the username that you want to have set into that instance variable, which is private. Um, now, you can use that to your advantage because with the setter method, you can actually control what it is that actually can and cannot be set into that private instance variable. So, for example, if someone is saying, okay, I want to set the username to be null, well, you can actually have something inside of your setter method that says, okay, if they're trying to set this value to null, then just don't set it at all. Just return back and, and be done with it. Ignore what it is that they're passing in. Or if they're, you know, passing in some sort of uh, data that you deem non-valid, like maybe a bunch of numbers or something like that, um, you can actually just do the same thing. You can sort of reject it and just return without actually modifying the value of that instance variable. So this is in contrast to if you were to make the instance variable itself public instead of private, if you made it public, then any class can go in and just set that value to be whatever you know they want it to be. You could just say, you know, user dot um, username equals, and then set it to be whatever you want it to be equal to, as opposed to user dot set username and passing in the value that you want to have it set to. So this is known as encapsulation and or data hiding because uh, you're not allowing anybody um, to go in and just randomly change. Uh, a value of a particular instance variable to be whatever it is that they want it to be. Now, this is a bit uh, of a strange concept because why would you want to do that? Why do you want to, you know, protect it with this encapsulation uh, principle? Um, you know, what's the purpose? What what's the advantage of doing that? Well, one thing is, let's say that you are designing a a system. Let's say you're designing some sort of um, application and you are, let's say you're in a big company and there's a whole bunch of programmers working for that company. Um, you can't guarantee that, let's say you, you create a variable and let's say that you know that if the, this variable's value is set to any particular value, um, you know that if it gets set to that, that there's going to be problems um, everywhere else inside of your particular part of the code. Like, let's say if someone's trying to set it to be null, you know that that variable, if it's set to null, it's going to wreak havoc on your application. So um, that's why you would make it private, and you would only expose that that variable through the public setter method so that you can catch that null and perhaps either return some sort of warning or print it out in the log or maybe maybe handle it in some special way, shape, or form um, so that you actually don't end up setting that value to be null. And... Um, and we do that because, like I said, perhaps you're working in a very large corporation and there's, you know, millions of lines of code and, you know, who's going to remember that maybe that username or that particular value, I, you know, I shouldn't set it to have any sort of numbers in it because it'll cause a problem. Um, or maybe it can't begin with a number or maybe it can't begin with a letter or maybe it has to be one of these values and you didn't, you know, set up an enum or something to... Uh, to represent those values. Um, so there's a whole bunch of different scenarios that can unfold where you'd want to use this sort of encapsulation, this data hiding, okay? Um, other, um, other uses are like, let's say you create an application that's meant to be used by uh, uh, completely different people. Let's say you're making some sort of 
you know, open source software, some sort of library that other people can use. And, um, and you know, those other people are going to be even, you know, further away from the actual development process that you went through to create that piece of software. So perhaps, you know, they didn't read through the documentation and they just tried to randomly set um, a value to this variable because they're just playing around with it or something. And uh, you want to be able to have that security in there so that, you know, a, a random, uh, let's call them a silly programmer or perhaps someone who's just not well informed, uh, they can't go and mess everything up. Okay, so this is this is really the, the one of the main reasons why encapsulation exists. This concept of of encapsulation because of the scenarios that I've actually laid out. All right, so that's like I said, pretty much encapsulation in a nutshell. So just uh, I guess keep on keeping on and keep on following those uh, that that principle, and uh, all will be well in the world. All right, so. Let's uh, let's move on to the final keyword. I'm not sure if I've actually had a you know quote unquote formal discussion about the final keyword, but uh, hey, what uh, what better time than now? So, the final keyword is used in Java essentially to define an entity which just cannot be changed um, after you have set it or after you have instantiated and assigned the variable, the final variable to be pointing to an actual object, okay? So if you, um, if you declare something final, the actual final keyword is to be used in front of either um, a class or um, a method name or uh, an actual variable uh, declaration itself, okay? So you can use this final keyword to say, I don't want this entity to be changed anymore. Once it's set, that's it. It cannot be changed. So, for example, if I were to have a final um, int um, called, I don't know, my int or something like that, and I assign it the value of 5, okay? So, final int my int equals 5. Um, and then I try to say, well, my int equals 6 afterwards. I try to replace the value that it previously had with a new one. Um, Java will actually catch that at compile time and say, no, you cannot change the value of my int, the my int variable, because you have declared it as final. And if it's final, once you've set it, that's it. You cannot change it. Okay. Now this can be used to your, you know, advantage in a few ways. Um, you can create constants with this. So you can create, let's say, um, uh, the constant of, well, you can say that my int could be declared as a constant, but usually you want to name it something more uh, meaningful than my int. Um, maybe you could say, you can name it, you know, max or maximum number of uh, threads or maximum number of people or users or, you know, who knows. Um, and you could set that variable equal to five, and you can make that sure that make sure that that variable is declared as final. And then you know that that's a constant that will never change. Um, and also, what's useful when you're declaring a constant is to make it static as well. So you'd have like a public, static, final, um, maximum number of users declared as an int, and then you say equals five. So then you could actually make it. It's public. And it's static, so you can make a reference to that uh, particular constant by just um, typing in the name of the class that actually contains that constant. So maybe that's inside of the user class. So then you could just say user dot maximum number of users, and then there you go. That will that will actually return the value of five because um, it's just an integer reference, or it's a reference to an integer um, that is that holds the value of five. So that's one thing that you can do with the final keyword, and you can be confident that that value will never be changed. No one will be allowed to change your maximum number of users unless they go in and modify it um, at the source where it's being declared. But hopefully, um, the programmer programmers who would have access to that would know the consequences of changing the value of that constant, but that's a whole other discussion. Um, so that's one, one use of the final keyword. Um, another use is is when you want to declare a, a method final or an actual class final. Um, when you do that on a method, what that means is this is the this is the way that the method will exist and operate. Um, so you are not allowed to uh, override this method. So let's say you declare a um, a method called 
well, let's just say you have maybe a two-string method or something like that, and you decide to declare it as final. So let's say we have like a, a user class, and we have the two-string method inside of the user class, and the two-string method perhaps just returns the username or something like that, um, and we declare that as final. But then we have, let's say, an admin user or something, administrative user, um, and that extends the user class. But then let's say that we want the admin user, um, the two-string method of the admin user to, instead of just returning the username, we want it to also return uh, the username plus maybe some sort of extra, you know, system access rights variable or, you know, who knows, right? Um, and we try to override the two-string method. It will not let you. Java will catch that at compile time and say, if you want to override the two-string method of the admin user, which extends user, you need to remove the final keyword from the user's two-string method because we've declared it as final. So when you declare it as final, it just means it cannot be changed. That is set in stone, um, you know, speak now or forever hold your peace. So uh, if you want to ever make a change to that, you need to remove the final keyword, okay? Now, usually this is used, uh, and sorry, so the same thing goes for, the same thing can be said for when you declare a class as final. When you declare a class final, like let's say you declare a user to be a final class, so public final class user. Um, if you do that, and then you try to subclass the user class, so that means that, you know, you try to create the admin user and say admin user extends user, same thing's going to happen. You're going to get a comp compilation error. Java's going to say, I'm sorry, but you've declared the user class as final. Um, if you want to subclass it, then you need to remove the final keyword. I just, I cannot let you do this. So the reason why we use the final keyword is uh, generally it's like a defensive, you know, programming kind of measure. So if you've, you've designed your whole system and you know that you don't want anyone messing around and changing the behavior of your objects, you can go crazy and add final keywords to your heart's content, and uh, and and there you go. You you've now you will now stop everyone from changing um, your classes uh, unless they obviously can go into the source code and remove the final keyword. Um, but let's let's say that you're you know releasing some sort of public library and and you know it's just a um, a jar file and they can't. Uh, have access to the sor source code or change it or anything like that, um, then there you go. You you declare it final and that's it. That's that's the be all and end all that that object is ever going to be if you declare the class final or a method final or perhaps a variable inside of there. So um, now having said that, okay, it's 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 nice from a design perspective to make sure that if you know that if a class should be final, then you you declare it as final, but as I mentioned before, in, in I believe it was the previous uh, interview or in a podcast episode where I was talking about interviews, um, it, it kind of wreaks havoc on unit testing. So, you know, if you can't, um, if you declare something as final, then you can't really unit test it unless you get, you know, creative with some different uh, library packages and whatnot. And it just, it, it adds a layer of, of let's say, annoying um, Ness, <laughs> for lack of a better term. So, um, you know, use it sparingly. You, uh, this is obviously my own opinion. If you don't agree with that opinion, then fair enough. Everyone is entitled to their own opinion. But I've been in a system where I had to unit test something or create new unit tests on an existing system that have finals everywhere, and it just got a little bit tiring to actually have to go through, jump through these hoops to to unit test the code. So. Um, but that's generally when you're declaring classes as final and you're de declaring methods as final. Um, you know, declaring a variable as final, fair enough. That, that There's always a good case for that, like, you know, if you have an actual constant or something like that. Um, then I'd say if you were going to use the final keyword, then by all means use it with your constants and whatnot, with the variables. Uh, sometimes you have to use the final keyword, like if you're working inside of... Um, an anonymous inner type um, or, or something like that, and you need to actually declare things as final in order for them to work, um, then fair enough, you need to use it. So there you go, do it. So uh, having said that, I, I want to talk about one, about one more thing with a final keyword, and that was something that actually sort of trips people up a little. Um, the thing with the final keyword is that it blocks you from being able to assign that variable to something else once something has already been assigned to that variable. So let's say we have a, a, 
a final um, object. Let's say we have the, the final uh, object, a user object. Okay, So we have a user object. It's declared as final. We have instantiated it as a new user. So that's our one assignment that we're allowed to do. We can instantiate a new user. But let's say that you want to change that. You want to say user.set username. Okay? You might think, well, I just said that once you set it, that's it. You can't change it. You're done. Well, it's true. You're not allowed to change the reference anymore. So when you've, when you've instantiated the new user object and assigned it to the user variable, that is your reference. You have a reference now that points from that variable to the object in memory. That reference cannot be changed. Okay, that's what the final keyword does. Um, if you were going to try to say, you know, user equals new user, then no, it's going to give you a compile error, compile time error, and say, no, you cannot assign this to be a new user um, because it's final. But you can say user dot set username, and you can set it to be something else because that is not changing the reference. It, the reference is still pointing to the same object in memory. It's that same user that you're referencing. You're just changing a property within that actual object that's in memory. And that is actually allowed. Okay. Another common uh, scenario that unfolds when you have the final keyword and sometimes it, it uh, trips you up is if you have something like an array list. So if you've declared an array list as final, you may think that you're not allowed to invoke the dot add or dot remove methods on an array list that's been declared as final. But again, if you do an add or a remove from an array list uh, that's declared as final, you're not changing the, the reference to that object in memory. Okay, All you're doing is you're adding or subtracting um, values or objects, uh, properties within that actual array list. And that's okay. Java does not stop you from doing that. You're not going to have any compile time errors. Everything's going to be a okay. So that's just a little uh, piece of advice that I wanted to make sure that you um, had you know clear in your mind because it's sort of an important concept. So what I what I would suggest you do is go uh, home if you're not home already. Um, get on your computer and and create a final list. Create a final array list. Instantiate it as a new array list and then play around with it. Try to assign. Um, so, you know, like I said, instantiate it as an array list and then try to say, okay, whatever you call that array list, like my list, try to say equals new array list. Okay. And see what happens. Uh, try to declare two different array lists. Um, you know, name them first array list and second array list, make the first array list final and then instantiate them both and then say first array list equals second array list and see what happens. And then invoke the dot add and dot remove methods on that first array list that you declare as final and see what happens. Okay? Play around with it. And then I think once you do that and once you see what you can and cannot do, it'll make a lot more sense um, because it'll be in front of you instead of, you know, me talking to you through a speaker. So I think that's a great exercise and you'll learn a lot from doing it. So, yes, by all means, go home and get it done. So. Now, through the uh, magic of email, let's, uh, let's switch topics and talk about questions that have come in from listeners. Um, this question, like I um, hinted about at the beginning of this episode, uh, comes in from a gentleman by the name of Josh, apparently Josh from Denver. So hello, Josh, if you're listening. Thanks very much for the question. Uh, he has a wonderful question about Java certifications. He says that he just listened to the podcasts about the interview questions and thought that having one or more Java certifications would be huge to uh, future programming sessions and success. So, um, you know, absolutely, uh, Java certifications can uh, can help you prove to uh, to employers that uh, that you mean business, that you know. Uh, what it is that you're talking about, that you understand Java, and it sort of removes the um, uh, uh, some of the um, contention or or you know disbelief that they may have if you didn't go through any sort of post secondary education system. Now this will vary from from employer to employer. Some employers will have the um, you know that stamp that you know you you're required to do post secondary and and we blindly make it mandatory and if you don't have a degree we won't even give you a second look. So um, 
I think it's really unfortunate that some companies feel that way. And I've talked about this openly before about how uh, I just think that's a silly way of doing it because I know plenty of programmers who went through university who are just horrible and don't even like to program um, and, and just do it to make money. And, and they're just terrible developers. Whereas someone who, who might not have a post-secondary education but has actually taken the time to go through a certification course, I, I don't know. I'm, I just think it's, it, it's good on you to, to, to go through that stuff and to prove that, that, um, that you mean business and that you're willing to go through uh, the, the intensive process of getting certified. So um, he wants to know uh, how difficult it would be to prepare for these things and, um, and how long are the exams and what, what are the best materials that you can use to get you ready for these exams. So awesome questions. I, I went out and did a bit of research, and um, I know without a second thought that Oracle, uh, who are the people who now own Java, um, Oracle provides a, a certification system. And I would, I would say that you should probably uh, lean towards taking the Oracle um, exams to get certified as a uh, certified, you know, associate or, or professional through Oracle. Now, um, that's sort of, like I said, the industry standard, and that's pretty much what people get. Um, and then it really depends on how, like, where you want to go with your programming stuff. Um, so for me, I'm a sort of a web developer, so I do a lot of, um, well, I'm pretty well-rounded. I do um, front-end web development, so when you're actually dealing with the look and the feel of the actual web pages, so that requires you to know things like HTML, um, CSS, JavaScript, um, you know, these these are the things that you kind of use um, to, to make a web page and make it look pretty. Um, now, on top of that, I use a technology called Spring that kind of ties in the front end, the HTML, JavaScript, and CSS and whatnot, ties that in with the actual Java programming language, okay? And Spring is something that you can actually get certified in as well. So, um, I, like I was, the point I'm driving at is this is sort of the, the direction that I went with my programming career, and I think that it's, it's definitely um, a, a very good choice. If you were trying to become a developer, I would definitely suggest that you either choose the direction of becoming a, a sort of uh, well-rounded developer that can program in both Java and uh, front-end web technology so that you can actually create a website because um, that helps you as a, a programmer getting a job full-time or if you want to go out and create your own web application and, and you know, maybe sell a product or, or promote someone else's product. You can get jobs uh, being a consultant um, and building other websites for other people who want to sell products or, or just give away information or something like that. Um, you know, there's tons of possibilities with, with web uh, design and programming and that kind of thing. So that's one really good route that you can go um, to really get a, you know, land a good job and, and really open up a lot of doors for yourself. The other route that you can go is to be like a mobile developer. So you can learn how to make mobile applications for, you know, the cell phones, the smartphones, like, uh, you know, uh, Android phones or iOS uh, phones um, or even BlackBerry. Okay, I know BlackBerry and Android use the Java programming language. The iOS uses something called Objective-C. Um, but in any case... What uh, it depends on the direction you want to go, but what the uh, the actual certification, uh, getting back to the question that he asked, the certifications that you should be interested in, is called the Oracle Certified Associate, okay, and that's for a Java programmer, Oracle sorry Oracle Certified Associate, okay, Java programmer. The uh, the abbreviation of this is O C A J P Oracle. <laughs> So I keep saying Orchid, <laughs> Oracle Certified Associate Java Programmer. So this is sort of the the entry level um, exam and certification that you can take to sort of prove that yeah you know this Java thing and and you know some basic stuff about Java and you can use it fairly comfortably and um, and you're sort of good to go for a standard sort of just Java programming job. But if you want to go a step further you could jump from the Oracle Certified Associate to be an Oracle Certified Professional. Okay, so that's sort of the next step. So from OCA to OCP, Oracle Certified Associate to Oracle Certified Professional. That's sort of level two. You're leveling up if you can get that one. And that's sort of your foundation level of Java. So not just an entry level type of thing, but it's the foundation and, and no, it proves that you know a lot about Java. You can be comfortable using pretty much um, 
any foundational aspect of Java programming. Okay, so um, that's sort of if you can get to la that level, then awesome. I, I would recommend that you get up to that level um, and and go out and and take your uh, take your chances with with getting a job and uh, and go in there and just be a rock star. Okay, so um, now as for actual material that you can use to help you study. Um, of course, if Oracle is providing these courses that, that you can, or sorry, exams that you can take to become certified, of course, they're going to be publishing a guide and making some money off of the book, the guide that you can purchase to get yourself prepared for these exams. Um, so you can just go on Amazon and just type in, you know, Oracle certified associate or Oracle certified professional, and you'll find the guide that goes along with it. Okay. Um, what I'll do now is I will include uh, on my uh, blog the actual links to the Amazon product. So you can go to howtoprogramwithjava.com forward slash session 25 and you'll see that I'll have both of those uh, study guide books available for you to click on. Um, but what, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do this a little bit differently. Those are actually going to be affiliate links. Um, so what's going to happen is if you click that link and actually go and purchase that book, I will actually get a small commission on that purchase. Now, the actual purchasing price of the book does not change for you. Um, it won't change because you're going through my link. The only difference is I get a little bit of that commission. So you'll be giving me a little bit of a nod and helping me out in my, uh, I suppose, venture to go out and create these things, these podcasts and this free material. So if you want to use the affiliate links that I'll have posted, by all means, go ahead and do that. Um, I'd be eternally grateful. and Thank you very much. Um, otherwise, that's fine. You don't have to do it. You can just go through the regular Amazon.com um, search bar, search for that, those books, and, and you'll be good to go. All right? Now. I can see. I think this is the. I think this is the American version of the book right now. The or Oracle Certified Professional is selling for about forty bucks on Amazon, and um, and that covers everything that you should need to get prepared for the exam. So it says um, it, it's a concise, comprehensive, step by step, one stop guide for the Oracle Certified Professional. Um, and I go for the the you know SE seven programmer exam. So you want to be up to Java 7 because that's sort of the, the latest uh, iteration of Java. Uh, so yeah, get grab the um, the version 7 book, um, and it talks about um, you know what it is that's inside the book. It talks about the mock tests that you have and a refresher course and, and in-depth coverage of all the 13 exam topics for the certification and blah, 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 blah. So hop over to Amazon. You can pick it up there, or I'm sure you could pick it up from your local bookstore. Um, you know, it's uh, completely up to you how you want to get that one. So... Um, that is the uh, essentially what you can do for um, the Oracle stuff to get certified with Java. But then, like I said, if you want to if you want to go along the um, sort of web web programmer to be able to create websites and whatnot, um, I, I would highly recommend that you also uh, check out Spring. And and Spring is not uh, I'm not referring to Spring the uh, the IDE that we use to actually do the programming. Um, but they actually have something called the Spring Framework that can be used um, in tandem with Java to be able to tie in um, a website, like an actual HTML page, with your Java programming language. So you can actually send data back and forth. Um, awesome stuff, awesome technology, uh, fairly straightforward to understand and learn. Um, I'm totally going to be jumping into some tutorials about Spring uh, once I'm done my HTML stuff and my uh, CSS and JavaScript lessons. Uh, so it'll, it's still a little, way, a little ways out um, before I'm going to be covering those topics. But um, if you want, you can actually become a sort of Spring certified professional um, and if you want to, you can just go to, uh, you can type in Google, say, how to become Spring Certified, and that will bring you to the springsource.org website where they actually talk about how you can become Spring Certified, and they say in three steps. You can, you can um, take this exam and, um, and, you know, grab the materials that you need to prepare for it. They offer a course, a four-day course that you can sign up for. Um, to prepare you for the exam, and then you can go to a specific location to take it in person and, you know, write the exam, and boom, there you go. You're now certified in uh, in spring. So there's also other frameworks that you can use. There's one called Struts um, that's just like spring, and uh, I'm sure Struts has a, a certified, you know, 
professional exam or, or certification that you can take. Um, but I'm just not very familiar with struts at all. So um, I'm just speculating. So who knows? I could be uh, full of it. So um, so there you go. That That's probably what I would do if I were to become uh, an Oracle certified professional. Um, I'd, I'd go there. I'd check out the materials via the Oracle website. I believe there's a cost involved. I know there's a cost involved in taking the course. Um, obviously, I'd, I'd prepare by buying the book. Um, and it's quite extensive. Um, I know Josh asked, you know, how difficult is it? Um, it's not a walk in the park. You need to really know a, a lot of stuff about Java, um, a lot of the nitty gritty stuff about Java that I haven't even talked about um, in any of my stuff. So, you know, there's a lot of stuff that you need to know about, you know, garbage collection and, you know, just the inner workings of Java, which to me, I've also talked openly about the fact that, you know, is it really, is it, life or death that you need to understand these things to be a programmer? Well, obviously not because sure, I don't know I don't know a lot about the inner workings of a lot of these things. I know a little bit about them and I know the concepts and whatnot, but that's as far as my knowledge goes. If I need to understand these concepts, if something funny is going on or if there's a situation where I see some code and say, hmm, what is that? Then I will would dive in and, and really, you know, go all out about learning this stuff and, and understanding it and, and being you know completely well versed in these topics but to be honest in the how many years have I been programming with Java probably since you know first year university what is that 10 years now with Java um, since the first day of, of having to deal with Java I've never need needed to understand and know that stuff in that to that level of detail Okay, so I don't know if that says something to you, but it says something to me about, you know, whether or not you really need to understand this stuff. If you want to become an architect and make, you know, a six figure salary or, or you know, I don't want to say or more than six figures. Of course, you probably can't do that um, unless you're an entrepreneur and you launch your own product. Um, unless you want to get really, really into the, the architect type of stuff with Java, uh, you just don't need to know it. Okay, but for these exams you do. <laughs> so you'll read the book. Um, it is quite involved. Um, I'm sure you're going to be pounding your head against the wall. And, um, but I mean, in the end, if you are, if you don't have a post secondary education in any way, shape or form, then you're probably going to need to get certified, uh, to show that you know your stuff. Okay. So there you go. There's my opinion on the matter. Uh, hopefully that was a, a good in-depth answer for Josh. Um, so Josh, if you, if you feel like I didn't answer a certain part of it, by all means, email me back. Um, or if anyone else has any questions about anything at all, by all means, just uh, shoot an email over to info at howtoprogramwithjava.com. And I will get back to you as soon as humanly possible, I promise. Cool. So there you go. That, I think, wraps up a cool uh, session number 25 for the How to Program with Java podcast. Um, and this is the section where I talk about my second edition of the ebook. I'm happy to announce that I am done putting everything together. It is now pristine. It's beautiful. It's waiting to be launched. Um, but I have to go through all of those hoops and stuff to get the book launched. Unfortunately, I need to go through the marketing and do all that business side of thing to get the book out um, into your um, willing hands. So um, I'm hoping that I can get everything ready to go for next week for a launch. Um, that's what I have in my mind anyway. And, uh, and that's what I'm shooting for probably late in the week next week. Um, so yeah, just obviously I've said it before, hopefully, uh, hopefully you've done it already, but go to howtoprogramwithjava.com. Um, in the top right hand corner, you can sign up for the mailing list, uh, get on that mailing list and I will let you know the instant it comes out. Okay. As soon as I hit that, you know, go live button with the book, I will be sending an email out to my, to my list to say, Hey guys, it's live. Go check it out. Uh, grab your copy. You're going to love it. So, um, like I said, it's full of good stuff, full of assignments, full of, um, actual audio podcasts as well in there, integrated with the book. Um, you know, videos, uh, tests, you know, everything. It's, 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 I've gone all out and put everything I can into that book to make it a one stop Java shop. All right. Cool. So I guess uh, I'll sign off now and, uh, and I guess I'll see you guys in the next episode. So until then, take care of yourselves and happy learning. 
Thanks for listening to the How to Program with Java podcast. Please visit howtoprogramwithjava.com for more useful Java tutorials.